Welcome to the third lecture on the decorative aesthetics, abstraction and ornament. In the first lecture on the classical aesthetics, we focused mainly on form, the constancy of form through time. In the second lecture on flux aesthetics, we looked at the role of glazes and glazed surfaces in ceramics. In this third lecture, on the decorative aesthetics, we will look at the role of decoration and of abstraction and ornament in ceramics. So again, this is another form of focus on surface, on decorative surface in ceramic. And I will start with a brief historical overview. Two wonderful ancient objects from millennia old. One, the one on the left is considered to be one of the most beautiful decorated vessels ever made, and it's from Crete. So it is interesting to consider that in historical time, and even all the way to today in certain cultures, decoration is highly symbolic. It isn't only meant for the pleasure of the eye and for decoration specifically. It, it represents other things like water, sexuality, regeneration, and in countries like India, uh, those types of pots are still made today for those very specific symbolic needs. It's interesting as well to consider that in many cultures, pots were painted with pigments that were not ceramic specifically, but were meant to add, again, more richness to the surface of the vessel at the time when access to pigments and colors that were not ceramics were uh, unavailable yet. And we have here example from Mayan time in pre-Columbian America, where the pots are painted over a plaster stucco surface as if they were fresco on walls of buildings. So decoration in ceramics has four main types. The first one is geometric abstraction. And abstraction in art goes back millennium, actually, and in art forms like painting and ceramics and many others. Abstraction is not a specific 20th century phenomenon, but has precedence in time. And this is a wonderful example from Japan from the 18th and 19th century. And you have here an example from, again, pre-Columbian America, from the Mayan culture, where you have a very striking abstraction going on. But you have to keep in mind that this very abstracted image is probably symbolic. It probably means something that is specific in that culture at the level of form, at the level of color, at the level of placement on an object. And this is quite important to remember that this is not just an ornament, but it is something deeply symbolic. So I'm just giving you another bit of information about the role of abstraction in art. In the 19th century, Georgiana Houghton did spiritualist drawings, which were at the one of the origins of abstraction in graphic representation. And this type of abstraction is called the arabesque. And this will be the second a form of, a, of a decoration we will be looking at after geometric abstraction specifically. Another very important artist in the development of abstraction in art is Ilma F. Klimt. And uh, she was a precursor, and of course she was long ignored because she was a woman. So um, art history needs to be rewritten in many ways, and the contribution of women to art and to abstraction and to other art forms like ceramics to that very important aspect of 20th century art making needs to be acknowledged and incorporated into the history of art as a whole. Other example of the work of Ilma Af Klint here, an exhibition that happened just two years ago at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. So it took almost a hundred years for her extraordinary contribution to painting, to art, and to abstraction to be fully recognized. So <clears throat> throughout many cultures, we find examples of abstraction. I'm just giving you here an introduction to the role of geometric abstraction in ceramic from the Chavin culture of Peru, from the Mimbres cultures of Southwest United States, 
and this approach to symbolic abstraction in pre-Columbian cultures is something that has continued to, uh, throughout the 20th century and is still ongoing today. We have an example of that here in the work of Maria Martinez, whose work we've looked at in the classical aesthetic at the level of form and also at the level of surface in the contrast between light on dark, dark on light that I have explained to you previously. So it's interesting that at the very beginning of the 20th century, as early as 1900, in the case of Michael Powalny, we have example of very minimalist and radical form of abstraction happening in ceramics in ways that will not be current in other fields like sculpture, for example, for quite a few um, decades after that fact or an artist like Clarice Cliff working in the 1930s and 40s in England, or Eric Slater from the 1930s again. So the principles of abstraction in art were not only found before in a field like ceramics and many others for that matter, but also were investigated within the field of uh, modernism in very striking ways. And this is an example of that in the work of Eva Zeisel from 1931. So as I've mentioned earlier, the Pueblo cultures of Southwest United States, the Acoma Pueblo being one of them, used abstraction for symbolic means in their work. And we have an example from Maya Ortiz on the right, which continues this tradition all the way to today. Lucy Lewis being one of the great artists of Acoma Pueblo, her work from the 1970s on the right, and a work by Virgil Ortiz from Northern Mexico from 2000. So you can see how abstraction and geometric abstraction can be used in very striking ways to make wonderful work. And what's interesting about geometric abstraction is the relation between the figure and the ground because the ground is the figure and the figure is the ground. They can switch place very strategically and very, very easily because the figure gives the ground and the ground gives the figure and for that reason they can flip position in space. And on the left we have a work by Rick Dillingham here where he built a pot with coil, then broke it into pieces and decorated each pieces independently on, of the other before reconstructing the vessel as a whole, so that he fragments and dis deconstructs and dis destroys and rebuilds the pattern as he goes. And a few more examples here of the wonderful work of the Pueblo cultures of Southwest United States, two work by Dorothy Torovio. And um, we, let's move to more contemporary work here with the use of bandings and horizontal bands in the work of Rosalind de Lille. So again, it's the strong contrast between light on dark, dark on light, but also the relationship between figure ground that is specific to geometric abstraction in ceramics. A group of work by Greg Pace using again banding and the connections between the surface and the form the form being informed by the surface and the surface informing the form by adding another element of complexity to the relationship between the two. And there are many, many examples of that. I'm just showing you a few here, some on the left by Ettore Satsas and a much older vessel by William State Murray from England from the 1930s. So this adds a lot of dynamism and energy and uh, motion to the objects by the use of repetition, of rhythm, of um, sequencing, and so on. And many, many artists use that, whether they are horizontal band, like we see on the left, or vertical bands, as we see on the right. This is a way to animate a surface and generate energy within a form with the use of not only the geometry of the pattern, but the alternating use of colors, for example, in the work of Daniel Buren, who is a very celebrated French contemporary artist who is famous for his use of banding throughout the development of his career as an artist. So geometric abstraction 
does extremely dynamic effects on objects and Elizabeth Fritsch from the United Kingdom has explored that potential in its relation to rhythm, to movement, to sound and music for example. She's also a musician and music and the language of music plays a very significant role in the development of the pattern she applies on her vessels. The great master of contemporary ceramics June Canico has used geometric abstraction and organic abstraction with a bit of the arabesque on the right, which we will see very soon. Uh, again, with the use of color and all, all, how all those elements come together to create something very powerful. I really like those swirly patterns by June Canico, combining again geometry with an organic feel but creating volumetric designs that are, create a, a feeling of volume in space in the application of a very graphic line over a rather flat form. And the work of John Mason, a very influential and important American ceramic artist working again with geometric abstraction at the level of pattern and geometric abstraction at the level of creating a form that's simply made with flat spaces that give you the illusion of a volume through their organization in space. And a younger artist working now combining geometric abstraction on ceramic vessel, but also sort of moving the abstraction and the pattern into the field of the space in which the objects are presented and displayed to, to create an installation that is holistic between the space in which the objects are and the objects themselves. And more contemporary work by Ricky Maldonado here where you know geometric abstraction can create surfaces of great richness, great complexity that create um, visual experience uh, of, of amazing richness. In Japan, Kenkishi Tomimoto, a contemporary and a good friend of Bernard Leach and Soji Hamada, was the great master of pattern on his work and this combines geometric abstraction with the arabesque in the use of swirly patterns and also the bringing in flower and floral patterns which we will see again a bit later on in this lecture and the work of junko kitamura from the 1990s simply impressing a tool into the dark clay and then filling the recess with a white slip that is then scraped off to reveal the intricacy of the pattern inside. And I really like this little Nabeshima dish on the right because it, rationally it doesn't make any sense. The position of the white vessel in space is irrational and cannot possibly be logical. But it's a very beautiful use of patterns. And the fact that the objects behave in an irrational way adds to the beautiful impression the small dish gives. The work of Gio Ponti, a, a celebrated architect and a modernist ceramist from the 1920s and 30s in Italy, using abstraction in wonderful way to create architectural space and illusions of space on the surface of a vessel. And Mutsuo Yanagihara, coming from Japan and working in the United States in the 70s and 80s, using banding and dots and circles over very original and quite extreme and excessive forms on his wonderful ceramic works. Just the simple use of a dot or a circle can create a, a new expression of developing the sense of space in, implied by the form itself. And Nakashima Arumi from Japan is using that very simple method and system to create work of great originality. As does Yayoi Kusama with those pumpkins covered with dots of various size to make you aware again of the development of the form in space. 
and I really like this very simple plate by Joyce Robbins where she has put quite large discs of color over her plate before glazing it with the somewhat translucent white glaze while reserving very tiny little dots over the larger disc of color so that there is this very interesting spatial relationship that happens between the position of those elements in space again. And the work of American Mark Farris combining approach to geometry at the level of form and at the level of surface and how the two come together in a very dynamic way. And again, an, a younger American maker, Nicholas Bivens, making large sets of dishes presented in groups where the role of geometric abstraction, again, at the level of the form and at the level of surface and the conflation of the two is very well resolved. So the second form of decoration in ceramics that I want to bring up is what I call organic abstraction and the arabesque is the main form of organic abstraction. And there are examples of that in the natural world, like galaxies, for example, or fractals, which are a form of endlessly repeating pattern, curves, joining curves, developing into more curves and splitting up and, and doubling up and continuously growing, if you wish. So this is why it, it is a form of organic abstraction. And even in the 19th century, woven paisley patterns from cashmere, a form of textile making, exhibit this form of combination of abstraction with the arabesque, a curve that splits and doubles and repeats endlessly with a very uh, interesting form of very early fractals. And even if we go back in time for millennium, like Neolithic Japan, we find example of arabesque and organic abstraction in those wonderful human vessel. Or in Roman times with the use of a syringe to ap apply thick layers of slip over those unglazed vessels. This is a form of the arabesque and geometric abstraction. And we have here two wonderful examples from Italy where there is a combination of graphic representation uh, figural representation, symbolic aspects to all of those elements coming together in very complex ways. And from Isnik, Turkey, from the 15th century, again, the organic abstraction becoming representational with the import of flower motif and animal motif within the field of this arabesque development of images in space. And the work of Nampeo, who I have introduced before in the classical aesthetics. This is an example of her early 20th century seed jars. And another precursor, Torvald Bindesball from Norway from 1895. And you can see here how figure grounds are in amazing relation to one another within organic abstraction. And a few contemporary examples now, the work of Anne Smith, the work of Ari Takemoto. And what's interesting about abstraction and decorative abstraction, whether it is geometric or organic, is this feeling of expansion that it can go on and on and on. Of course, it stops within this physical space of the object on which the decoration sits, but it basically implies continuity in space forever and that's a very interesting characteristic of uh, decoration and geometric and organic abstraction that I want to stress here. You have an example of that in the work of Gisela Manteja where large surfaces are covered with patterns that could basically go on and on forever. And many contemporary makers are using this great possibility of decoration to speak of this feeling of expansion and continuity in space that is quite potent. On all kinds of objects, all kinds of vessel forms, all kinds of pottery form that can be either quite functional or deconstructed in very exciting ways like in the work of Betty Woodman, the role of organic abstraction and the arabesque both at the level of making the form and then putting a surface 
uh, decoration on it um, create work of amazing again rhythmic complexity and husband and wife team john gill and andrea gill have been exploring this amazing potential for surface and form image and objects 2d and 3d to come together within the field of decoration in ways that have never been done to such amazing originality and power before and the work of Soji Amada again from the 1960s showing how uh, organic references to nature within the field of organic abstraction can come together in exciting ways and in England the work of Alan Caker Smith working with luster wares on earthenware again brush strokes and marks of curves and curves leading to curves and joining to other curves which is the main characteristic of organic abstraction and what I call the arabesque Bennett Beam, Philip Maybury I'm just showing you again a few examples of work that I find quite potent quite exciting quite original and, and very interesting for a number of ways you may want to research those makers further and find out how they develop this type of work and what what else have they done and we have examples of that here in uh, blue and white which is the next category we will be looking at after the floral field of decoration but i wanted again to introduce you to a few artists like steve Einemann from canada or alison Britton working within the field of decorative possibilities in ceramics with organic abstraction and with the use of the arabesque in their work the third type of decoration i want you to be aware of and consider is floral decoration because the use of flower in ceramics is very interesting and and very ancient like we can see here from those brick walls from mesopotamia which incorporate flower and again it's to keep in mind the symbolic nature of flowers in terms of regeneration and fertility and the passage of season and time and its its connection to natural cycles and all of those things and people have used flowers in ceramic for a long for the longest time since the very beginning of ceramic history we have here again two examples by Lucy Lewis, one incorporating birds and flowers and flowing lines representing water again, a very important element in this part of the world which is quite desertic. So people use flowers and ceramics for all kinds of reasons because it, it creates a reference to history, to previous works, to an approach to style and to domestic aspects and so on and many artists are using flowers to comment on the position of ceramics within the larger world one of the most extreme example of the use of flower in ceramics is what is called thousand flower motif from Qing dynasty China which is 19th century China and again this is not just ornamental each flower has its own symbolism each color has its own symbolism and the coming together of all those flowers and all those colors it implies another form of symbolic meaning and yuki ayama on the right references this connection to the past to history and to extreme approach to making that is characteristic of thousand flower motif in ceramic in china and you can see here how an artist like Leopold L. Fulham has used the thousand flower motif again to connect his contemporary practice to historical practices and make you aware of what is a vase, how does it work, what is it about, how is it experienced, what is our relationship to it, and how all those things come together to create very exciting new work. Leopold Fulham has used historical references and flower motif in all kinds of ex exciting ways in his work and his work is analyzed further in the reading for this specific lecture as well. And artists from everywhere are using floral motif for all of those reasons. 
Liu Jianhua from China, an artist whose work I constantly come back to because he's, the complexity of it fits in many of the aesthetics and many of the theme that we will be looking into in this series of lectures. In Japan, the Kakiemon family started to make wonderful work in the 17th century using the whiteness of porcelain as a ground. And we've looked at this connection between figure ground before, and we will do so again next week in the narrative aesthetic uh, lecture as well. But the Kakiemon family still operates wonderful workshops in Japan, and this is an example of their work from the 1980s. And of course, a, a, a lecture on decoration must mention the work of Okada Kenzan from 17 an 18th century Japan because he is, in my opinion, possibly the greatest decorator and he was a very influential maker in the development of Japanese ceramics in the 20th century through the work of Kitaoji Rosanjin, for example. And this work was, again, tremendously influential in the development of all kinds of approaches to decoration throughout the world, as we can see here in the work of Minami Doashi, on the left, a follower of Ogata Kensan, and even in this wonderful landscape bowl by Wayne Igby on the right. And Kensan's teacher was Nonomura Ninsei, one of the great decorator in the history of ceramics as well, here using floral motif, again, for their symbolic potential. And you can see from this work on the right by Grayson Perry from 2001 how the work of Nunumura Ninse and other preceding potters have influenced the making of his work at the level of form, at the level of surface, the use of patterns, and how all those various aspects come together to create a statement about contemporary life in contemporary society. And again, another example of Nonomura Ninsei's work on the right and on the left, a reinterpretation of that motif through fragmentation and the conflation of contrasting and oppositional aspects in his era wear. Jim Dine, in a much more representational and graphic work, working with underglazed pencils and simply drawing on pots. Uh, Jim Dine is a great pop artist mostly a painter and a sculptor, but he's a great graphic artist as well with an extreme graphic sensibility. And this is an example of his work in ceramics. And to complete slowly this section on floral decoration in ceramics, two examples, one from the 19th century and one from more recent times using the modeling of flowers and the 3D aspect of those elements in space to again create a very dynamic relationship between the flatness of the form and its volumetric aspect with representational image represented in uh, space. An example of that on the work of Adrian Sachs from Los Angeles again to create objects of great extreme quality very excessive over the top that don't quite make sense but create uh, uh, an experience for you that challenges you to reassess your, in, your feeling about those objects and how you experience them. Two wonderful uh, lighting device, one from Mice in Germany from the 19th century and a contemporary example by a contemporary maker. And floral decoration in ceramics can be used within an architectural context as well. We will look at that later on in the shelter lecture when we move into the teens after week uh, eight. And many artists working now are using ceramics and floral decorations to create sculptural work of great ambition, great complexity. Again, this is done in my opinion because of the symbolic nature of flowers in terms of growth, regeneration, the cycle of nature, fertility, uh, sexuality, and so on. 
and um, we will be moving on into blue and white which is the fourth category of decoration and this is a great example of that with the floral decoration by Joe Pinkelman. So blue and white is the last category we will be analyzing in this lecture on decoration. So after geometric abstraction and organic abstraction and the arabesque and the use of flower in ceramics, the use of blue and white decoration is very important as well because it is basically specific to ceramics as an aesthetic. It begins in ceramic, this use of blue motif on white grounds or sometimes white motif on blue grounds. But you can see here in those traffic lights from Jintajin, China, the city where porcelain was first invented and where blue and white was uh, one of the main decorative devices used for centuries. And on the right, an example of Medici porcelain, the first attempt of recreating porcelain in Europe in the 16th century. So you can see here how many artists like Brendan Tang are looking at historical precedent coming from Asian ceramics, its transformation through its passage through Europe. Here an example from Dutch Delft, from Holland from the 17th century, and how using those historical references within a very contemporary and technologically informed context creates work of great uh, contrast and oppositional dynamism. Two more examples here of the work of Brendan Tang using blue and white, the illusion of porcelain, the illusion of plastic and other material, and the conflation of the two to again challenge you to reassess the role of um, ceramic within contemporary culture. Philip Barn, working in China at the time, he made a, a few trips to China in the beginning of the 21st century, and he asked makers there to deconstruct patterns over a series of similar identical forms. For example, six bowls, where each bowl has an aspect of the final um, image, which is just pine trees and, and uh, cherry branches, and see what happens when you deconstruct and de take apart a pattern and see only one of its aspects at a time, what, what happens to the richness of that dispersion, if you wish. Barbara Didot doing something quite similar also in Jintajin, China, where she had a large series of bottle form made for her, and then a series of specific process of making ceramics in Jindijin were transferred onto each vessel by a large number of painters reinterpreting the work of the predecessor who had painted the previous form. Again, the work of Leopold Fulham working with the blue willow pattern. The blue willow pattern was invented or created by Minton at some point in the 19th century. And it is the most popular dinnerware pattern in the world. More dinnerware were made worldwide with the blue willow pattern than any other pattern in the history of ceramics. And many contemporary artists are using references to blue and white and the blue willow pattern. And the second most popular dinnerware design in the world is the blue onion pattern coming from Meissen, Germany, of which this is an example. And some artists coming from that culture make references to the blue onion pattern, while many others will be using the blue willow pattern, like we see here in the world of Richard Shaw, because of its familiarity, because of its domestic connections, because of the fact that it has been used for so many years because of the fact that it is a, a European pattern imitating a Chinese pattern and uh, uh, or, or its origin in China anyway. I'm not going to give you the whole history of the Blue Willow pattern. There are books on that subject you may want to research. But Stephen Bowers from Australia using the Blue Willow pattern in some ways. Rory McDonald from Canada. It's quite interesting to consider that in the last 20 years, there has been an explosion of the use of the blue willow pattern by many artists from all over the world in ceramics. And I really like this play by Caroline Slaughter where she has sandblasted the blue willow pattern to keep only 
a very small element of it in her plates. Karen Ryan does a bit the same thing. Those are found objects that she's modified by sandblasting images by putting stencil first and using a sandblaster, removing information. She doesn't want to create new information that changes your relationship to the object. Robert Dawson, again, using sandblasting to remove information and blurring the blue willow pattern. Or digitalizing the blue willow pattern and changing its scale, modifying its position in space, recreating new decals by digital technology and applying those fragmented elements and transform and distorted and twisted elements on new dishes or creating a large number of dishes that recreate aspects of the blue willow pattern um, that, that goes from forms to form to form to create a larger pictorial field. And on the right, an object by Howard Cutler, a paisley cup from the 1970s. Howard Cutler is one of the most important and original and radical ceramic artists working anywhere in the world in the 1970s. And his work is of great complexity, great intelligence, and has a, brings in a conceptual approach to making that's quite exciting. And many artists, knowingly or unknowingly, are following in his footstep. You have an example of that here with Matt Smith in his Bad House Willow, or Nicole Leong, Breaking Tradition. Paul Scott, working in the last 20 years or so, working with blue and white for, again, its familiarity and its um, domestic quality, and so on, and, and reworking those images either by removing information or by adding new information to it, creating collage that comments in very dramatic ways and efficient way on all kinds of contemporary issues. And again, many other artists, this is a collective called Grid24, using the blue willow pattern and the, the coming apart of the pattern and the sinking of images to speak about issues of uh, you know contemporary conflict and so on. Jerry Webb from Australia making blue willow flip-flops. The flip-flops are an Australian invention and recreating the blue willow as a three-dimensional series of objects. Livia Marin, again, deconstructing the blue willow pattern as fragments, as shards on a large number of pieces. Graphic designers are also using the blue willow patterns to create map covers for laptops or for iPods. Dan Moyers in his Calamity Wear is again reworking the blue willow pattern with monsters, with earthquakes, with bombs, with war scenes, and so on. So this very innocent image, which is a, a very interesting narrative in itself, we will, we will see next week in the narrative aesthetic presentation how what is the nature of the narrative uh, quality of the blue willow pattern. But it's a very potent field for expansion of the possibilities of ceramics now. Sing Ying Ho, a Chinese-Canadian, again using references to Asian history, European history, her own life, uh, uh, the complexity of living today in her work, or Kurt Weiser, creating very original graphic images of collage and coming together of all kinds of things in, in blue and white in ceramics. Blue and white, as I've mentioned, is a very specific ceramic aesthetics. It starts in ceramics, in the Islamic times and in the Tang Dynasty in China and goes on all the way to today in various ways. And I think many artists are using blue and white in their work for this deep and continuous connection through geography and time with the past and with tradition and with the power of pattern to speak to, of human experience through time. And you have an artist like Daniel Kruger speaking of issues of sexuality and masculinity and role play in society within the context of a dish, within the context of decoration and ornamentation, which are all feminine aspects in uh, the cliches that we have to analyze cultural aspects. Li Xiaofeng making those wonderful dresses 
and costumes out of broken shards of blue and white porcelain. This is a detail here of a suit that he made for Lacoste in France. And you have here an example of Jasper Ware by Wedgwood, where the heel of the shoe is a ceramic heel made with Jasper Ware. And what's interesting here is that instead of blue and white, it's white on blue. That is the opposite aspect of that aesthetic and one quite interesting to consider. And you have here two artists, Daniel Listouin and Wim Delvoy from Belgium, working in the white on blue reversal to create work that speak through the use of decoration and ornamentation and blue and white of various very important and significant issues in contemporary society. And the work of Richard Minet making works using faux shards, fake broken pieces of ceramics coming from different time, different cultures, different aesthetics to recreate objects that again challenges you to reassess your relationship to ceramic as an art form, its connection to tradition, to style, to, to history, to making, to oldness versus um, impermanency and um, fragmented experiences. Anna G with her sex toys. Anna G is also an artist whose work come back, comes back regularly in my lectures because she approaches ceramics from so many different angles and uses so many exciting aspects of it that her work fits in in many of the um, conferences I'm giving in this course. Sarah Goffman working with papier mache. Those are not ceramic objects. They are made out of paper but they references ceramic forms, ceramic surfaces, here the blue willow pattern and so on. And it's quite exciting to see how many artists that I have introduced to you within the classical aesthetic already before use ceramic references and blue and white references into their sculptural work or installation work. And you have an example of that here in the work of Jeffrey Mitchell from Seattle making display cabinets out of wood referencing domesticity. Again, it's a found object that he found in a junk store in which he has displayed his wonderful ceramic objects that he made himself. Or an artist like Shelley Miller working with sugar. This work is completely made out of icing sugar, but it references ceramics at the level of tile making, at the level of the pattern and the decoration used. And of course, all of it is impermanent and will be destroyed rapidly by weather since they are inserted into architectural exterior of building. And many people work with those ideas digitally as well, creating digital photograph and virtual works, incorporating the feel of ceramics at the level of surface and form, at the level of color and pattern, and references to dishes and domesticity and bodily parts and, and sexual and emotional and psychological relationships. Eduardo Sarabia working with images of war, of conflict, of strife within the world, um, combining all kinds of references to the drug war and the, the troubles with the war on drugs and uh, so on. And, and ceramics is a very interesting context for those issues to be discovered and explored. Many artists, this is just a brief selection, there are many, many more using ceramics, blue and white, decoration, aspect of representation with all kinds of subject matters and contexts that complexify the possibilities of things coming together in exciting ways. You have an artist like Chris Martin working for Johnny Walker, making those porcelain cast form with exciting blue and white surfaces. Danny Menor, Mel Robson, it just goes on and on and on in whatever country that you are from. People use blue and white and the blue willow pattern and references to it all over the world because it has become a universal pattern used and made everywhere all the way to now. Charles Kraft in the United States making references again to violence, to war, to all kinds of very deep and profound issues by making 
um, work in ceramics, which is quite an innocent material perceptively, with blue and white patterns, which again are quite banal and dismissively innocent, and that creates a conflation and a conflict between the two that reinforces the commentary he is making with his work. Ai Weiwei, a Chinese artist of great uh, celebrity right now, making work by reversing the pattern, putting it inside the vessel instead of an, on its exterior, presenting them in space connected to the ceiling and the floor at the same time, and again making you reassess your experience of ceramics, its fragility, its breakability, its usual experience in domestic context and what happens when those works are presented in great instability within a spatial context that is public and, and connected to art making. Ai Weiwei has done a tremendous amount of ceramics in an ongoing way, making references to metal, to plumbing, and so on. And, and again, it's this approach to putting things together that are not supposed to be together and what happens when something that's supposed to be metal is ceramics, when suppose that something that's supposed to be non-decorated becomes highly ornamented with blue and white patterns. Nicolas Galanin making references to First Nation mask making and again the conflict of colonization of different cultures coming together and you know butting against one another and what happens in that uh, conflation. So it's this is just again a, a somewhat brief introduction of the great potential for decoration in ceramics whether it is geometric abstraction, organic abstraction, the use of flower or the use of blue and white to comment and create work of great originality, great power, and we see example of that in the field of design, in the field of fashion as well, where, where Nike or Bodega or Prada are making works referencing ceramics, referencing blue and white, referencing all kinds of patterns that are find their origin in ceramics and speak to us today of that extreme potential for connectivity that exists between those fields when they come together in a very exciting way like those blue willow shoes and boots by Doc Martens or those designed by Valentino. Uh, there was a big exhibition called China Through the Looking Glass at the Met in 2015 showing how ceramics and blue and white patterns inform the world of culture worldwide. You know, it's, it's just the invasive nature of the blue and white pattern within all kinds of fields, all kinds of contexts. That's quite exciting to analyze and consider. The porcelain orchestra in Jindijian, China, makes music using porcelain equipment and tools and instruments that are all made out of blue and white porcelain. People paint their old body with blue and white patterns for all of those a reference that it can create and and connection that it can create with previous experience we've had. The Shanghai acrobats balancing porcelain dishes in their movements in space also covered with blue and white patterns. And the very last image I'm showing you today are from the Deborah Kalker dance group from Brazil where they have attached porcelain objects to ropes and strings that can be moved in space and displaced within the set design as dancers move around and jump over and around those objects. And again, it's the emotional, psychological experience that it provides because we understand those objects for their familiarity, their domesticity, but their connection as well through history, through culture, through time, but also for their immense fragility and the danger they imply if they were to break, they could become quite dangerous. And uh, this creates a, a contrast between the experience we have of those objects and the experience that is presented to us in those wonderful dance that is, again, of great power. Thank you and see you next week.